Good evening, everyone. So good to see you this evening. Thank you for coming out uh, to hear the Word of God. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah and to join us as we uh, build the walls together uh, with Nehemiah and uh, his helpers. So beginning in Nehemiah chapter 2, we're going to read from verse 11 down to verse 16. Nehemiah 2 verses 11 down to 16. But in the will of the Lord, we'll perhaps get further than that even into chapter 3 this evening uh, with his help. So beginning in verse 11, it reads this way. It says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me. Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. But when I, then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned and the, ru the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did. Neither had I yet as told, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews nor to the priests nor to the nobles nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. And God will bless that short reading of his precious word to us this evening. So we want to just uh, examine uh, this section, particularly in thinking about some of the principles of Christian service that we can learn from this little section. And the three things that I want to point out, and one is investigation. And we're going to see that in verse 11 through 16. And then we're going to see some cooperation as he, having investigated himself, what he had heard previously, just to make sure that what he had heard was actually accurate. Sometimes we hear things, and they're not accurate. So he wanted to make sure that he was dealing with reality. And so he investigates things first. Then he encourages others to join him in the work. There's some cooperation, which we're going to see in verse 17 and 18. And then, again, we see the enemy rise up, but despite the enemy rising up in verse 19 and 20, there's determination, despite opposition, to build for God. And so, basically, that's the pattern we're going to look at, at least in this first section. So, I want to begin with this idea of investigation. Notice it says in verse 11, so I came to Jerusalem. Uh, just a few words, but to come to Jerusalem uh, from uh, the capital of the Medo-Persian Empire... Uh, it wasn't a quick flight. Uh, it was quite a journey in those days. And so when he gets to Jerusalem, we notice that he was there three days before he does anything. And part of that would be, I'm sure, just a time of rest. After a long journey that he's just taken, he's got an immense task before him, uh, that of the rebuilding of the walls. And it's good sometimes, you know, one of just a simple principle in Christian service is you have to know when to rest. Even the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, come apart and rest a while. And, and if you're going, 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 eventually uh, you'll get an enforced rest. <laughs> the Lord will make you rest. Uh, so, so there's this need uh, for rest, but perhaps also a need, he's been praying, as we observed yesterday, and fasting uh, for four to five months from when he heard this information to when he actually arrives here on the scene. And so uh, after that time frame, even then he doesn't rush into it. Uh, even though the needs are great, he doesn't just rush into it, but again, another three days. I'm sure that not only is there rest there, but there's also communion with God. There's more prayer going on, more preparation of heart. And then he comes to the point of investigation. And we had mentioned this, that, that uh, it, it, you hear things at times, and sometimes what you are told, when you investigate it yourself, you find that what you'd heard wasn't true. Now, he had heard the walls of Jerusalem were in ruins. 
uh, I've been told, I remember one time I was going to an assembly, I'd been asked to go there, and uh, people said to me, oh, you don't want to go there. Well, I'd never been there. Am I going to believe what they say, or am I going to go myself? So I decided I'd go. I went to this assembly. I'm so glad I went. It was probably the most amazing prayer meeting I have ever been in in my life. Maybe people didn't like it because people were really earnest in seeking the face of God in prayer, but it was wonderful. And it was so easy to preach there because of the great prayer that was going on. And yet, I'd heard negativity about this assembly. When I got there, there was nothing to be negative about. What I'd heard had no basis in reality. And sometimes, we just need to do some diligent investigation. When we hear things, is it really as it says? Or are or, or, uh, um, people exaggerating? Are people changing or, or saying things that are not correct? So on getting there, he's going to do this. But he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. He's not coming, making a big scene. He wants to just investigate first, check things out. So he says, I arose, he says, in the night. I and some few men with me, verse 12, Uh, Neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Again, he wants to investigate it first. Uh, Notice again that God had put this in his heart. If we're going to do a work for God, it's always wonderful, isn't it? If that work, that burden has been put on our hearts to begin with. That he has burdened us for this work. And he doesn't have to tell anybody. Sometimes I think we, we tell people too much too quickly. We, we boast about something before we actually are, are ready to do anything. He wants to just check things out first of all. And uh, not tell everybody what he's planning to do or anything like that. Just to, uh, well, to convince people to join him. If his facts are not correct in the first place. He's going to undermine his credibility. And so he has to check that things are right. So he does this, uh, this tour of the city. He does it by night because he's not trying to draw attention to himself. We might just say this too. Many, many a shepherd are awake at night when other people are asleep. Right? He's, he's awake at night. <laughs> When other people are taking a nap, he's out there checking things out. And, 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 and I, I know that... Uh, Uh, True shepherds uh, often can stay awake at night because of the state of their flocks. Concerned about the state of the assembly. Concerned about things being in ruins. And they lay awake at night concerned and and, and praying about these situations. Well, he's there at night time. Even after this long journey, uh, and he goes around. He says, neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night. And again, why just the one beast? Because again, he doesn't want to draw attention to what he's doing. He wants to get the facts right first before he encourages others to to join him. And so he goes out by night uh, by the gate of the valley. That would be on the west side of the city of Jerusalem. And he goes down to the dung port. So he's going down to the bottom, the south end. And then comes back up uh, the east side as far as the fountain gate uh, in verse 14. And it says, by the king's pool, many believe that's the pool of Siloam, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. In other words, the the rubble and the ruins were so bad that it was impossible for his beast to actually cover that ground. And so so he's getting a, a real touch of reality here, isn't he? He's seeing it is as bad as people had said it was. It really is in bad condition. Uh, because it, he can't, it's not even safe uh, for the beast uh, to ride over that, that area. And so he, he tells us uh, in verse 15, Then went I up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. Now it would seem that he didn't do the entire circuit of the walls, but, but he did perhaps half of it, kind of a semicircle of it. And in doing that, he saw enough. There was enough evidence there for him to say, this report that I have heard is absolutely accurate. The walls are in ruins. The gates are burnt. It's a confirmation of the true state of things. And what he's learning is that the task is staggering 
right? It's not just a case of rebuilding the walls, but you've got all the rubble that you have to remove before you can build. And, and so tremendous tasks set before him. And it's sometimes as we look at the state of assembly testimony, if we're really honest, there are many assemblies, as we said, are hanging by a thread. Those that are there in fellowship are old and few in number. Humanly speaking, projecting down the pike, there's going to be a lot of closures. By the way, I've seen a lot of assemblies close in my 30-odd years of being in assembly fellowship. And, and so, humanly speaking, it, it, it seems overwhelming. There's so much against us. And we have to remind ourselves that if God be for us, who can be against us? That, that despite the difficulty of the task, we might ask ourselves the question, as bleak as it looks, and, and it's good to get a, a touch of reality, it does look bleak, but we have to come to this state, is anything too hard for the Lord? In fact, let me say this, that generally speaking, and we're talking really of the book of Nehemiah, of, of a revival, a, a, a tremendous revival. If we get to chapter 8, and that's my goal, we're going to see the Watergate revival. And there's a tremendous revival takes place as a result of all this activity. But what I've observed, and I've done a lot of study of the history of revival, that usually revival comes when things are bleak. So actually, bleakness could well make an optimist out of us, couldn't it? Because this is a perfect time, God, for you to step in and show yourself to be who you are, right? Because humanly speaking, it doesn't look good. And I've always had this prayer, this burden in my heart, Lord, I want to be part of a work where the only explanation is you. No other explanation. Not man's cleverness, not man's ideas, uh, just you, you showing yourself, you taking the field, you, as it were, rolling up your sleeve and bearing your mighty right arm and showing yourself strong. And when God does that in revival, it's an amazing thing. I was reading at the meal table this evening uh, with, uh, with Dave and Angie about the revival on the Isle of Lewis. And prior to the revival, there were certain individuals that, that it seemed like the Lord had shown them revival was coming. Didn't look likely. But it sure came. And it was an amazing, amazing work of God. And so again, we just need to see that, yes, it, it is good to be real, to be realistic about the problems. And even have our hearts broken by the cold, hard facts. And that's what we've seen in Nehemiah. Remember we saw early on that, he, that his heart was broken. He, he did pray. He did weep. He did fast because of what he heard, now he's seen the evidence and it really is true. And so the cold hard facts are really there to, to see. And so his heart is broken. But the main thought really of this section, and I, I just want to em emphasize this and stress it, is the immense need of any work for God can always be met by the infinite grace and power of our Savior. No matter how difficult it looks, God is able, and it's just good to be reminded of this. And so we've seen the investigation. Nobody knows except the few that have gone with him. Verse 16, the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. No, he, he just keeps it to himself. He's just making sure that he's got a clear picture of the task ahead. Now he's got a clear picture of the task ahead. How can he somehow rally everybody else to get involved in this building project? And remember we said that these people have been staring at that rubble for years. They've been used to looking at failure for years. How can he somehow stir them up and say, let's build? And so we'll notice verse 17. It says, then said I unto them, you see the distress that we are in. It's always good to notice the pronouns, isn't it? You see the distress that we are in. Remember he said that he 
saw himself as part of the problem in the first place in his prayer. He said, we have sinned. It's not, he's not saying to them, you see the state you're in. Right? It's so easy to point the finger. You see the mess you're in? As if I'm not part of this. He says, no, no, I'm actually a part of this too. Even though he's coming from Shushan, the palace. I mean, he's not even in the area, uh, yet he, he, he identifies himself with the people and with the city that God has chosen to place his name there. And he says, you see the distress that we are in. How Jerusalem lieth waste. And he's seen it with his own eyes now. And the gates thereof are burned with fire. Again, he's seen it with his own eyes. And then he says this, Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. You notice a couple of things here. He doesn't say, Look, we're in a terrible state. You know what you need to do. Right? It's easy to be an expert and give everybody the advice. This is what you need to do. No, he doesn't say that. He says, this is the thing that we need to do. <laughs> uh, he says, um, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem. In other words, I, I'm going to join with you in this project. I'm not just going to be the person telling you what to do. And again, what experience does he have as a wall builder? You know, he's a chief butler. He's, he, he's a cup bearer. But he said, I'm willing to do this. Are you willing to do it with me? And so the, he's encouraging cooperation. Having faced the magnitude of the task, Nehemiah realized the absolute necessity of securing other people to help him in the work. And as we think of a New Testament assembly... The whole point of a New Testament assembly is we're never depending on one individual and hiring him and paying him to do the work, right? It's, it's a collective effort of every person, every believer functioning according to their gift to build up the local testimony. And, and we want everybody involved. Everybody's a role. Everybody's a, a place to play in this in, in this this process of building for God. And, and so he tells them, let us rise up and build. <laughs> let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Again, it was a reproach to have a city that was associated with the name of the Lord in ruins like this. You see, that city is indelibly connected with his name. And to see it like that, it was dishonoring to that name. And so that's the reproach. It's a reproach to his name. And when an assembly is in tatters spiritually, that reflects on the name of the one who we gather to, doesn't it? And so somehow we have to work together to remove the reproach so His name is magnified and glorified in our midst, which is what we desire. And so He says, Let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them, in other words, in to encourage them. He, he wants to encourage them and, and tell them, What's going on here? What's led to this moment? Why he's ready to, uh, to set apart uh, for this task? He says, I told him of the hand of my God, which is good upon me. He wants to tell him about the exercise the Lord has given to him and how he's done it. And it's always good to do that. But I just want to go back to this idea of unity of purpose for a minute. Before we focus so much on uh, what God has done to bring us to this place. Why does he want everybody involved? Because unity of vision and unity of purpose is so important in anything we seek to do for God. What we could say is this. Um, one writer, S.D. Gordon, he said this, cooperation increases efficiency in amazing proportions two working together in perfect agreement have fivefold the efficiency 
of the same two individuals working separately. Right? Two working together, fivefold efficiency. Where does he get that from? Just look at Deuteronomy 32 for a second. Deuteronomy 32. And verse 30. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? Right? You, you get the math? One can chase a thousand, but two, ten thousand. That's five times efficiency, isn't it? And, and of course, in that case, it's because God had abandoned them and they were under judgment. But it, we get the principle that cooperation makes for much more efficiency in terms of our service. And what we could say is this, and we could say this categorically from the New Testament, that when the Christians are of one accord in one place, there's always blessing. You see that throughout the book of Acts. Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is to see brethren dwelling together in unity. And as you read that lovely short psalm, it ends up with this. For there God commands the blessing, even life forevermore. And there's always blessing in unity and togetherness in work. Uh, and so if, if in an assembly we're all pulling in different directions... We're not going to make any progress. Everybody's got their own agenda. Everybody's got their own idea. But if there's unity of vision and unity of purpose, oh, how effective would that be? And so we want to emphasize that. A crew of people working together for God alone, that's tremendous cooperation. And that's what we're going to see. They're going to, they're going to rebuild the walls in 52 days. That amazing? I mean, we're talking about, a, you know, this is not a garden fence here. This is a big city wall going around a city. It's a huge task, and yet working together, and when we get to chapter 3, we're going to see all the kind of people that work, and many of them had no experience on a building site, but they had a heart. Somehow this heart that, that God had put in his heart to do in Jerusalem, somehow he was able to encourage them that they would have the same heart. And so they were able to overcome all the difficulties because there's this oneness of heart, oneness of vision. And they're going to work together for the glory of God. And so he says to them, as he tells them of Taking away the reproach, I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. So he tells the story, how God had brought him here. And notice it says, as also the king's words. Notice he doesn't tell him the king's words first. He starts in the right place. The good hand of God upon me, and then the king's words. In other words, this has been a work of God from start to finish. He's the one that's given the burden. He's the one that's opened the way for me to even get this leave of absence. He's, he's worked in the heart of this man, if you remember from yesterday, to allow this to happen. God has worked. So he tells him of all what God had done. And as a result of sharing his experience of God's leading, and, and then he says, uh, the king's words that he has spoken to me, they said, they said, <laughs> notice this again, verse 18, and they said, let us rise up and build. In other words, he has so effectively sold the vision to them that it's become theirs. You notice the transformation now? It's not just him saying, let us, they're saying, let's rise up and build. And suddenly they've got the vision. Is it important to have vision? Where there is no vision, the people perish. Isn't that true? Do we have vision? What is the vision of the assembly here in Moncton? You know, the many assemblies, you know their vision is? Keeping the doors open. Didn't go beyond that. And you know what? I've been in assemblies like that. That's the vision, keep the doors open. You'll oversee the closing of the doors. We have to have a bigger vision than that. Did the Lord give us a bigger vision? 
Lift up your eyes. Look on the fields. The fields are white and ready to harvest. Right? Get a bigger vision than just keeping the doors open. A bigger vision than that. And, and so there's been a lot of agonizing in prayer. Now uh, we see that uh, the vision has been sold uh, to them and they're, they're together. They, they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. And so there's a, there's a determination. And that leads us to this final section the, of chapter 2 and the determination factor. And in verse 19 it says, but. So again, we, we mentioned this, that now there's a unified group. They're all on the same page. We're all ready to move forward together. And, and the minute that that happens, you get this word, but. <laughs> Uh, this, this contrast word. But they're, they're strengthening their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Interesting how word got out to the enemy pretty quickly what God had put in their hearts to do. And the minute that they're ready to rise up and build, the enemy rises up to seek to stop them. And how does he begin? He begins by mockery. They laughed them to scorn. Mind you, they did that with somebody else, didn't they? Didn't they laugh the Lord Jesus to scorn? And let's be honest, if we are going to be all out for the Lord Jesus, much of the world would laugh us to scorn. And many of them do. Why would you waste your life? That's what they think we're doing, right? They, they have no sense of what we're about here. And, and there's mockery. There always is. They laughed them to scorn. That's, and, and of course, who, who likes to be laughed at? Uh, it, unless you're want to be a comedian, generally speaking, to be laughed to scorn is, is not a good thing. And that's what's happening here. They're laughing him to scorn. They despised us. Isn't that amazing? All they want to do is build the walls of Jerusalem and they despise them. And I think increasingly we're seeing in the North American continent, those that want to stand for God are increasingly despised. There's a hostility. They tell us that we're, we're hate preachers when our message is one of love. Isn't that amazing that our message is one of love and yet we're called hate preachers because we stand with God against sin. That's what they hate. <laughs> and so uh, there, there's going to be not just mockery. If we're going to build for God, there will be those that will despise us as well. And not only did they laugh the Lord Jesus to scorn, but he was also despised and rejected of men. And so we're serving a rejected Savior by the world. It's kind of part of the package. If you identify with him, you're going to experience what he experienced. Mockery, laughter, people despising you. And then what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Now, interesting how he is up to this point. He hasn't pulled out the letter from the king. And even now, it, when they mock him, he still doesn't bring out the letter from the king. Remember, he, he got a letter of commendation from the king for his task. Notice verse 20. Then answered I them and said to them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. No mention of the king. See, it's not the letter from the king that's given him confidence. It's the fact that God has put this in his heart to do this at Jerusalem. And, and so God is with us in this. And so no matter what you do, no matter how you mock, we know that God is with us in this task. And so he says, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. 
By the way, what amazing confidence. Nehemiah has tremendous confidence in God, doesn't he? He's convinced that this is God's work. And the God of heaven, because it is God's work, the God of heaven will indeed prosper this work. And then, not only is this God's work and the God of heaven will prosper it, he reminds them that despite their mockery, it says, we, his servants, will arise and build. Our intention, no matter what you do, no matter how you mock, no matter how you despise us, our intention is this. We're his servants, and we're going to build. No matter what you say, we're going to build. There's determination there, isn't there? Investigation, cooperation, determination. Notice too, it says, But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. He says, it's God's work. We're going to arise and build. And we're going to do God's work in God's way, which means we don't need your help. Right? These are not Jews. They're not part of the people of God. We don't need... They're, they're, they're convinced of doing God's work, arising and building, and we're going to do it in God's way based on the principle of separation from the world and its ways, its methodology. We don't need your help. We're going to build. And we recognize you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. This is not your affair. This is ours. We're going to build for God. Now we get into chapter 3, and this is where it gets very interesting. If you just read it at face value, it's just kind of a list of names at different places on the walls. And if you just look at it that way, you think, well, what value would there be in this chapter? Actually, we're going to spend two nights on this chapter. So there's a lot of value in this chapter. I hope that we'll see it. But what we're going to observe as we do, and I'll just mention a few things as we look at this, One of the things that stands out as you read this chapter is how they work together for the task. And the way it's conveyed in the chapter is through a little phrases that are used, this repetition of phrases. I want you to notice, for instance, verse 2, one of the phrases is this, and next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zachor the son of Imri. Verse 4, and next to them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. And it keeps going. Uh, again, we could go all the way through the chapter. I, I just did that this afternoon and underlined, highlighted every one of the times it says next unto them. And other times it says like verse 16, after him. And then verse 17, after him. Uh, repaired the Levites, Rehum, the son of Bani. Next unto him repaired Hashabiah, the ruler of half part of Kila in his part, after him. And verse 19, next to him, after him, after him. So, we said this seems to be an impossible task. In fact, if I would put a title over this chapter, I'd say it was this. Mission impossible, how to accomplish it. It's an overwhelming task when you look at the walls in their present state. So how does he accomplish it? How does he get this work done in in a mere 52 days? Well, the first thing we notice, he had appealed for cooperation from others, and he had been given it. There was a warm-hearted agreement and reception from the people in Jerusalem when he asked them to build. In fact, they even said, let us rise up and build. And so what he does, there's a bit of organization going on here. He actually divides the wall up into 42 sections. In other words, the task itself seems enormous. But by breaking it down into smaller portions, it's not quite as hard to do. Uh, My wife is at home working on our income taxes. And the reason she's doing it is because I would leave it till the end of the year just keep throwing the receipts in the drawer, the receipts in the drawer, and then it would come to tax season, and I'd have this mammoth task of this great big pile of receipts, and it was overwhelming. I hardly wanted to even get out of bed to face it. It was so overwhelming. But what my wife does is 
she gets those receipts from me as soon as they come in and she starts recording it every single day bit at a time and she just did it in like two days done all she had to do was pull all the pieces together finished right what was an overwhelming task for me because she broke it down into small segments wasn't difficult at all well she would tell you it was difficult but she makes it look easy and she, the reason she makes it look easy is because she breaks it down and, and so sometimes that's the way it has to be if we're gonna the work of an assembly if everybody does their little part what seems like a mammoth task actually can become quite simple if we're willing to all do our little bit <laughs> and that's how an assembly is supposed to work isn't it? everybody doing their little bit and and the whole thing fun functions beautifully if everybody does their bit the difficulty is when people don't do their part it puts tremendous pressure on others to make up for the slack of those that are not doing their part and it, it puts a tremendous strain on the work it, and so this is what he's doing he's he's uh, appealed for cooperation he's going to break it down into bite-sized pieces and each person is going to as it were do their part and so uh, tremendous uh, way he's going to do this now he's going to take us on a tour around the city and he's going to tell us who's doing what and we're, we're going to actually start this time at the northern tip of the city and again we're going to go anti-clockwise we're going to go around the city and then go back up again to where we started and so he's going to tell us each person that's on the wall and what part they're playing and, and it's amazing how all these names are recorded. Because I want to just suggest there's a great lesson here. God is a great record keeper. He keeps wonderful records. And everything done for him is recorded. It's here for all eternity what these people did. Because even though heaven and earth will pass away, his word will never pass away. So this record is forever written here isn't it of what these individuals did but also I would say in the life of an assembly the Lord is paying attention even if nobody else notices what you're doing the Lord notices and and he said even a cup of cold water given in his name will in no wise lose its reward and so even if nobody else says we appreciate what you're doing. I can assure you, based on Nehemiah chapter 3, the Lord appreciates what you're doing for him. For his assembly, for his work. The little bit that you think you're doing, he's taking records. He's keeping marvelous records. And so, we're going to make this tour. We're going to see what each individual is doing. And, again, the work is accomplished, even though it seems like they're few in number. Seems like they're limited in resources. They're surrounded by enemies trying to block their efforts. But cooperation, everyone played their part. Just like we read in the New Testament about the church being likened to a body. And how every part is important in the body. Now, some of them are not necessarily... I don't think anybody here has seen my kidneys. You probably don't want to see them. But... They're behind the scenes, but I can assure you I'm really thankful they're working well tonight. The whole body is based on every part doing its part, right? And that's true in the human body, true in the body of Christ. And so he's broken it down into sections, all are working together, and part of an overall plan. And again, let me just say this, that I know it's a fine balance. Uh, we, we don't want it all to be man's planning. And on the other hand, we don't want it all to be chaotic either right in other words there has to be some kind of order and organization and it's a danger because we can over organize and leave no room for the Holy Spirit on the other hand somebody has to be here to open the doors right so somebody is assigned that responsibility to get here and open the door you know what I'm saying little things like that we have to have some responsibility somebody has to get the elements ready for the remembrance meeting or else it would be an embarrassing thing to sit here and there would be no elements on the table right so, so there has to be some kind of organization 
And, and so uh, what we find here is Nehemiah is a good organizer. We're going to see he's actually an excellent organizer in the way that he arranges the different workforce around the wall. So for instance, in this teamwork that he is basically encouraging, and, and we see, although he's, he keeps himself out of the picture here, he's telling us what everybody else is doing. That's, a, that's by the way, that's a good leader, right? He's out of the picture, but he's, he knows what everybody's doing. He knows where everybody's working, but he's, he's, he's behind the scenes here. He's kind of working away, uh, organizing all this, and, he, and I'm sure he's working because he's saying, let us rise up and build. He's going to build with them, uh, but he's not telling us about himself. He's telling what everybody else is doing. By the way, it, it's really encouraging to, to tell people that you do appreciate what they do. Remember, it was an uh, assembly I was in, and um, we, uh, we had this, uh, I was in the oversight at the time, and we used to visit uh, systematically the various families in the assembly. And part of the purpose of doing that was we, we kind of didn't want to be a crisis management team. We didn't just want to see the saints when there was a problem. And so we tried to visit on a systematic basis every family in the assembly as, as a group of elders. And one of the things we would do as we would go and visit them is if they, we had observed things that they were doing, we tried to encourage them in it. So this one couple I'm thinking of, uh, he, was a, he was a quiet brother. Uh, in fact, he rarely ever said anything at the remembrance meeting. Just a quiet man. But you know what he used to do? He would always empty the trash. He would always make sure the bathrooms were clean. He would always sweep. He would always come and take the elements away and he'd wash them. All kinds of different service things. He was like the ewers of wood uh, that, that were in the temple, right? I mean, they're not necessarily bringing it up, but the wood offering is pretty important, right? It makes everything else possible. And so he was this quiet guy behind the scenes. So we, we met with him and we said, to this particular brother, and his wife was a very faithful Sunday school teacher. And so we said to them both, we said, look, we really appreciate your service for the Lord. We've noticed that all the things that you do, and, and we're just thankful to God for what you're doing. And this guy began to weep. He said, I, I don't do this for recognition, but I honestly had no idea that anybody noticed. And he just needed that word of encouragement, and it meant the world to him. She was a very diligent, faithful. I mean, she put her heart and soul into her little kids that she was teaching. She put her heart into that. We encouraged her in that. She was, and she, we need that encouragement. And it seems like Nehemiah is telling us, these people, look at what they're doing. They're serving the Lord. They're building for God. We appreciate what they're doing. And so we notice he begins in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. They sanctified it, set up the doors of it, even to the tower of Mia, they sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. So several things about this verse. First of all, notice who it begins with, the high priest. Notice where he's building, by the sheep gate. Do you think there's any significance of him working by the sheep gate? You see, what came through the sheep gate? Well, the sheep. Why did they come through the sheep gate? For the temple. For the offerings, right? And so, obviously, the priest, the high priest and the priest have a vested interest in restoring the sheep gate because it makes their work much more easy that you can bring these sheep through that. You, you get the idea? In other words, here's Nehemiah putting somebody in a place where he has a definite interest in that area. And of course, we need to think about that in terms of assembly work. Somebody's an evangelist. You want to encourage him to do what he's gifted to do, right? And somehow have him doing that kind of thing because that's where he's gifted. That's where his heart is. That's where his interests are. And so we want to try and encourage people in areas that it's significant to them. But the other thing that's so fascinating is, notice that the high priest doesn't say, well, actually, this is beneath my dignity. 
to remove rubble and to build walls. My hands are involved in finer things. My hands are involved in sacred things. Uh, why would I be asked to do something like this? Get somebody else to do it. We're the priests. We're a special class. No, no, none of that. The high priest, in a sense, leads by example. He's supposed to be a spiritual leader of the nation. And in this project, he's taking the lead. That's a great example, isn't it? And that's why when we think of local assembly elders, el local assembly elders are meant to be ensamples to the flock. That's a pattern to follow. right? They're supposed to lead by example. And, and, and so here's this high priest and the priests. Man of such dignity, exalted spiritual leader of the nation, and can you imagine it clearing away heavy rubble, carrying heavy stones, setting them in place on the wall? Uh, uh, amazing. Now, sadly, Eliashib doesn't end well. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Let's, talk, let's commend him for what he's done before we have to say about what he didn't do right. But, but he did this. This is a big deal. This is a great example for others to follow. And so he begins in this way. Yeah, and so... Uh, we, we notice, and then notice it's the only part of the wall where it says they sanctified it. That word sanctify means they set it apart for God. Now it's not that the rest of the wall w wasn't sanctified, but in a sense they did this part and set it apart for God in a sense as a symbol of the whole. This whole wall was going to be set apart for the glory of God. Remember it represented salvation, the gates represented praise, and so it's all set apart for the glory of God. They set up the doors of it, even to the Tower of Mia. They sanctified it to the Tower of Hananiel. Next to him, builded the men of Jericho. That's interesting. They weren't even from Jerusalem. They're from Jericho. They could say, that's not our responsibility. We're not from there. <laughs> but no, they joined in the work. Isn't that encouraging? That, that they... They recognized that this, even though they didn't live in the immediate vicinity, but this city was a city connected with the divine name. And he, they wanted to take away the reproach. And so they came and they worked and they served and they built it. Uh, next to them built Zachar, the son of Imri, and so on and so forth. And all's going really well. Everybody's building, everybody's building. And we get to verse 5. And next unto them, the to the Tekoites from Tekoa, Tekoites, repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. This is the first little bit of descent, isn't it? And again, maybe the nobles, they felt this is beneath our dignity. After all, we're nobles. We're nobility. This is not a kind of work for us. And so they did not put their necks. Notice what it says. To the work of their Lord. Isn't that interesting? Why call you me Lord, Lord, and you do not do the things that I say? Peter. Remember Peter? Um when he was asked to go to Cornelius' household? Not so, Lord. <laughs> kind of almost contradictory terms, is it? Not so, Lord. They put not their necks to the work of their Lord. And again, I just want to say this, that he, here it is recorded for all eternity that although there were workers, there were also shirkers. Now that should motivate us a little bit. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be a terrible thing if in eternity at the judgment seat of Christ, which is where our work for the Lord is going to be assessed, that we're going to find that the assembly struggled because we didn't do our part. We didn't use our spiritual gift to build up the body. We didn't serve like we should have done. And all those years, that assembly just struggled on because a major part of the body wasn't working. Amazing to think, isn't it? And here it is recorded. 
It's not good to be a shirker and to be known for a shirker because other people are having to do the work that we should be doing. And that puts pressure on people. And so we might ask ourselves, and again, I don't know the assembly well enough here to make any judgments, but the Spirit of God is able to show you whether you're a worker or whether you're a shirker. You see, in assembly life, there's something called assembly privileges and there's something called assembly responsibilities. The privileges are the blessings we get from being in assembly fellowship. People pray for us. People encourage us. They, they teach us the word of God. It's like it's a lot of blessings in being part of a local assembly, but they're also assembly responsibilities. I have some friends, and they're uh, lobster fishermen, and they, um, they buy ships together, and uh, they, this is down in the Bahamas, and they, uh, they put down uh, traps, not, not the traps like you use here, this is cold water lobster, think spiny lobster, warm water lobster, don't have the claws, but they put these little habitats uh, on, the, on the ground of the ocean, and what happens is that the lobsters are the cockroach of the sea. They like dark places. And so they go into these habitats, and just like cockroaches, they breed prolifically. And so they let them do their, do their thing, and then at a certain time of season, they go and they dive down, they tip over the, the habitat, and it's just full of lobsters, and they start spearing them. And then they get them and bring them back. And they're the main supplier of red lobster in the United States. And so they can, especially if lobster prices are high, they can make a lot of money in a season. Now, there's a lot of investment to get that money. You've got to buy into a boat. You've got to do all the work of making the traps and putting the traps down. And So there's a lot of work involved, but there's a lot of remuneration. So I said to them one time, I said, look, I want to come in on your ships. I want to be on the ship. I don't want to pay any money. I don't want to do any work. In fact, I might even come along on the ship sometime, but I'm going to just sit on the deck, get a suntan, and read some good books. But when you get your paycheck, I want an equal part. And they looked at me. They said, you're insane. <laughs> and then I said, there's a lot of people in assembly life just like that. They want all the benefits. They won't do any of the work. Kind of challenging, isn't it? What it means to be in fellowship in a local assembly. It, it, it's used in the New Testament. That word is translated partners in terms of a fishing business, interestingly enough. And the partners worked together. They mended the nets. They went out. They did the work. And they shared in the benefits. And so that's the way it should be in the local assembly. And so we have to ask the question, are we like the nobles who did not put their necks to the work of their lords? Now, I just want you to look, please, at the book of Romans just for a moment. Romans 16. Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 16, and verses 3 and 4. Romans 16 is a little bit like chapter 3 of Nehemiah. Because it talks about all the work that people were doing in the various assemblies. It's just names, a list of names, but it's very fascinating. Verse 3, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. What a commendation. Right? And it's, here it is. It's recorded for all eternity. Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ, who've laid, for my life, laid down their own necks. Interesting, the Bible has a lot to say about necks. Look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, 
and verse 51. Stephen, speaking to the elect nation, and he says this, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. What a terrible indictment. Stiff-necked. You know, if somebody has a stiff neck, a stiff neck, it's very hard to bow, isn't it? If you have a stiff neck. You know, to bend down. Remember what the Lord Jesus said? He said, take my yoke upon you. Now, in order to get under that yoke, you can't get under that no yoke if you've got a stiff neck. Because you've got to bow down to get under the yoke, don't you? And so, it seems like, in New Testament language, the nobles... <laughs> put not their necks to the work of their Lord because they didn't want to take his yoke and be co-laborers together with him. It's not good to be stiff-necked, is it? It's good to be willing to lay down our necks for the things of the Lord. And so it's good to ask ourselves in terms of the testimony here, as the records are being kept, What's my contribution? <laughs> what would it say if the Lord produces the kind of document at the end of the day of the testimony of the work here in Moncton, New Brunswick? And there's a list of this brother did this and this sister did this and this. And then it says, and this person, well, they didn't put their necks to the work of their Lord. I don't think you'd like that, would you? Well, there's one way to get around it. Bow the neck. Get under the yoke and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? That's a great place to be. Lord, what would you have me to do? How can I make a difference in this local assembly? Show me what to do. You know, my wife and I, when we go to the meeting, we often pray, Lord, and this is, whether I'm speaking or not, it's irrelevant. I'll say, Lord, how do you want us to minister today somebody who maybe just needs a shoulder to cry on maybe somebody just needs a word of encouragement maybe somebody just needs taken out for lunch and ask how's how's it going but you you we're supposed to come with a heart to serve aren't we it's more blessed the lord jesus says to give than to receive how can i be a blessing how can i make a difference how can i build up the work for the glory of that lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, show me what to do. I'm in. I want to serve you. And maybe it is taking out the trash. I don't know what it is. The Lord will show you if you have a willing heart and a neck that's bowed. He'll show you. May God help us. We, we want to build for God, don't we? We have to have a vision. We have to have unity of purpose. We have to have determination. There will be opposition. But we have to have a willingness to work. Lord, what, what do you want me to do? Show me how I can make a difference in this local testimony. And time is gone. But in the will of the Lord, we're going to do some wall building tomorrow night. I hope you're willing to join us as we build together for the glory of our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus.